Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel, and thank you for joining me for today's exploration into the Tuatha de Danann, a people of the old world. The Tuatha de Danann come from Irish myth and legend, yet they may have truly existed. In today's exploration, we're going to examine who these people were and what their role was within Irish myth. We're also going to glean an understanding of Irish myth and it should be noted that I don't believe that one myth or one culture's myth supersedes any other. We're just looking at Irish myth first because that's connected to earlier explorations on the channel. I will be exploring other myths and other legends from other cultures across the land, and I may spend some time doing that. The Tuatha de Danann in Celtic mythology, a race inhabiting Ireland before the arrival of the Milesians, the ancestors of the modern Irish. They were said to have been skilled in magic, and the earliest reference to them relates that after they were banished from heaven because of their knowledge, they descended on Ireland in a cloud of mist. They were thought to have disappeared in the hills when overcome by the Milesians. The Book of Invasions, a fictitious history of Ireland from the earliest times, treats them as actual people, and they were so regarded by native historians up to the 17th century. In popular legend, they have become associated with numerous fairies still supposed to inhabit the Irish landscape. So we have the mythology and we have the legend. And here we have this typical debate between something that was supposedly fictitious, the Book of Invasions, and yet it's regarded by native historians as being an actual people and actual accounts. Why is it that this account of history and myth is always so clouded? Yet one group always claims that they know what really happened and yet another group doesn't. It seems as though the real intention behind this is to cause us to question what our true history was, or we know the reality with saying what a history is and what it really means. The Tuatha Dé Dan and a magical race that possessed supernatural powers. Most of them were godlike creatures or divine beings that were being worshipped. This race was also known to believe in the goddess Danu. She was sometimes referred to as the mother, and another translation of their name is Followers of Danu. The Tuatha Dé Danann came from four major cities, Phalius, Gorius, Phineas, and Murius. The whole concept of the Tuatha Dé Danann coming from four cities is remarkable. There's also further detail in the legend and the myth that the Tuatha Dé Danann fled from Ireland or fled from the world to the north for reasons unknown. The interesting thing about Irish myth is there's a lot of missing components to it. And one has to wonder why there's so many missing components when we have other myths from across the land that seem to be more complete. What interests me about Irish myth is the fact that there are these missing components, and yet, again, there's this reference from the 17th through the 19th century, a questionable time, that gives indications that this may have been something that truly occurred. The fact that legend indicates that the Tuatha Dé Danann went to these four cities, I wonder if these four cities could have been the four cities in the unknown or lost lands to the north. And I think there's a lot of validity in that theory based on what we're reading in the myth. And this is why we're going to explore the Tuatha Dé Danann going forward. Irish tales and mythology. We need to have a better understanding of Irish tales and mythology and why it seems to be somewhat incomplete or in a state of disarray in terms of its organization. It's almost as though that was something that was intentionally induced to make understanding these accounts, which may have a lot more basis in fact than a lot of people like to believe, difficult. Irish mythology is a vast world of legends and tales. All of them existed in the pre-Christian period, and according to some sources, they ceased to survive right after that. However, these tales are still passed from generation to generation, one after another. And we have to wonder about this statement of pre-Christian period, because going back to the film Excalibur, it almost seems as though the major religions of the world have been with us far longer than we like to imagine, and no doubt came from previous eras. The organization of Irish mythology gives us some clues in terms of why it seems the contemporary world we live in wishes to keep it in a state of disarray. It's organized in four primary cycles. The mythological cycle, a cycle mainly about myths and fantastic legends, and makes up most of Irish legends. And this is the world that you'll find the legends of the Tuatha Dé Danann. Yet they do also appear in the other cycles, most notably the Finian cycle. 
The Finian cycle concerns the stories of Fionn McCool, a legendary hero and a group of warriors and military order called the Fianna, which we have covered briefly in the video about Skellig Michael. We also have the Ulster Cycle. Mythological Cycle focuses on supernatural elements, and this focuses more on warriors and battles. And then the King Cycle, or the Historical Cycle. Interesting name. The cycle holds those two names, and most of the tales fall in this category belong to the so-called Medieval Period. And you have to wonder if the introduction of this particular cycle is designed to confuse the tales from the other cycles, or to question how accurate they may be. Regardless, it seems as though the cycles do give us some organization to Irish mythology, and yet many people will tell you that the reason Irish mythology is not more known in the mainstream is because it's incomplete, unlike other myths such as the more famous Greek myths, which seem to be much more well known. We're going to be attempting to fill in some of the details with these cycles and look to see how this may be a historical account or an objective factual account of what may have happened in eras in the past. It seems as though the Tuatha Dé Dan and Hale from a time between the first and second era, and that the real cycles that will be focused on, the mythological cycle and the Finian cycle, occurred specifically during the second era, in terms of this channel's theories on breaking down our actual timeline. The Tuatha Dé Danann brought fascinating skills and wisdom to Ireland when they arrived there. They gained those skills from four wise men who resided in the four cities, one in each. Sinius was the wise man who resided in Murius, Morius and Phalius, Urius and Gorius, and Arius and Phineas. Over and beyond, the Tuatha Dé Danann brought four treasures from the four cities, treasures that were beneficial to Ireland. And we'll briefly look at these treasures now. We have the Cauldron of Dagda. No company ever went away from it unsatisfied. A remarkable piece of technology, and we have no idea what it really looked like, and yet there are many accounts that state that it seemed to be able to produce whatever material needs that the Tuatha Dé Danann needed filled in the moment. Remarkable. It reminds me almost of a matter replicator from the Star Trek series. Isn't it amazing to think of the possibility of such technology? Of course, we'll be told that it was magic or that it's merely myth. Yet, one thing I think Arthur C. Clarke, a science fiction writer, was correct in stating is that to a people that encounter technology that's beyond their comprehension, then the people that possess that technology are going to appear as though they are deities, which is something fascinating to consider about the Tuatha Dé Danann. The most famous spear is referred to as Luja's Spear. Sources claim that it was brought to Ireland from the city of Phalius. The latter was one of the four cities that the Tuatha Dé Danann came from. The spear's head was made from dark bronze and it was sharply pointed at its tip. It's also remarkable how we have so many different references to spears within our so-called history. Most importantly, the spear possessed magical abilities. It was impossible to overcome in battle or to defeat the warrior who wielded it. And we have to wonder what the true nature of the spear really was. The Sword of Light, second treasure of the Tuatha Dé Danann. It belonged to Nuada, the first king of the race. It came from Phineas City. The sword has actually made an appearance in plenty of the Irish folk tales. It plays a part in Scottish myths as well. There were several names to it. Shining Sword, White Glaive of Light, and Sword of Light. The Irish equivalent to its name is Clamensolas, or Clara Sholas. Pronunciation on Gaelic is not one of my strong points, but regardless, this sword seems to have inspired many other swords and many other legends. We have Excalibur pictured in the top right here, and the channel covered that film earlier this week. And then we have the Sword of Light, which played a critical role in the mythology or legend of the Game of Thrones or World of a Song and Ice and Fire in George R. R. Martin's works. Remarkable in terms of considering what this legend really could have been and what the sword truly was. One thing I'll note is that while it's called the Second Treasure, in some accounts the treasures of the Tuatha Dé Danann are numbered, and in other accounts, they are not. Last, we come to the Fall, Stone of Fall, is a stone at the inauguration mound on the Hill of Tara in County Meath, Ireland, which served as the coronation stone for the King of Tara and hence High King of Ireland. It is also known as the Stone of Destiny or Speaking Stone. According to legend, all of the kings of Ireland were crowned on the stone, perhaps the same story as Stonehenge. 
Now we know from many accounts that the standing stones at Stonehenge were replaced and that the energy in that location has changed. This particular location is somewhat questionable because it does have the same story that goes along with it that perhaps the stones are replaced. Nevertheless, the location itself still seems to retain the energy and it's a remarkable account in terms of what the stone really could have been or represented to both the Tuatha Dé Danann and to the subsequent Kings of Ireland. The High Kings of Ireland were actually members of the Tuatha Dé Danann originally, but the lineage from that time depends on your interpretation of the myth and the legend. The Goddess Danu. Danu was the mother goddess of the Tuatha Dé Danann. That is why their name means the people of Danu. She is one of the very ancient goddesses in the history of Ireland. Her modern Irish name is usually Dana rather than Danu. People usually refer to her by the goddess of earth or the goddess of land. Her main duty was pouring her power and wisdom, the lands to bring prosperity. Danu possessed a lot of fascinating skills. The mythology states that she passed most of her skill to the Tuatha Dé Danann. As a consequence, most of the members of the race are either divine figures or supernatural beings. It's a remarkable consideration, though, that we say they're supernatural beings, and yet they had a goddess themselves? It makes you wonder in terms of what the true account is, and who was this Danu? We have numerous myths across the entire land that tell us that all the roots of our civilization came from some sort of divine intervention. Now, mainstream contemporary accounts, such as scientists and historians, will tell us that this is just myth. These were people trying to explain their origin when they had no origin story. Now we'll tell you about evolution, and that's your story, and that's all you need to know, and things possessed during the Bronze Age, and people made pyramids by floating the blocks in vast pools of water, etc. However, I think it's a remarkable consideration, though, that these types of legends and myths are what actually persist across the land, and there is consistency in them. There are many connections, and this is the first one that we're examining in greater detail. Nuada of the Silver Arm. Before the Tuatha Dé Danann arrived in Ireland, Nuada was their king, who remained the king of the Tuatha Dé Danann for about seven years. After those years, they entered Ireland and fought the Feebog. The latter were the inhabitants of Ireland by the time the Tuatha Dé Danann arrived. Before fighting the Firbog, Nuada asked if they could take a portion of the island for the Tuatha Dé Danann. However, the king of the Firbog refused, and they both prepared for the upcoming war. That was the Battle of Mog Torrid, where the Tuatha Dé Danann won. Unfortunately, Nuada lost his arm in this battle, and 50 soldiers carried him out of the field by Dagda's orders. Despite the loss of Nuada's arm, the Tuatha Dé Danann gained Ireland as land for themselves. He's called Nuada the Silver Arm because they replaced his arm with a silver arm. Isn't that a remarkable consideration in myth? Was it really just a silver arm? Of course, we'll be told that it was magic that animated this silver arm. Or was it some sort of technological component that was behind it? You have all these references to these remarkable aspects, and someone will just tell you that it's just a perspective, that you've been reading too many science fiction books and you're trying to assign these rational explanations for what may have happened in the past. And yet these references are just far too many to simply ignore. And it's what makes the Tuatha Dé Dan in a very interesting tribe, race, people to consider. And it certainly indicates that they were an old world people. The Fomorians, a ceaseless wheel of war and peace. During the seven years of achieving the perfect arm of Nuada, Breas was the temporary king. However, he wasn't purely from the Tuatha Dé Danann. His mother belonged to that race, but his father was a Fomorian. Probably his mother's origin was the reason he made it to the kingship. Nuada had to pick up where he left off. He retook the kingship, however, they were no longer as peaceful as they were. Reyes seemed to be bitter about having to leave the chair and was by all means an unpopular king who favored the Fomorians over his people. Thus he initiated a war with the Fomorians against the Tuatha Dé Danann. They were also still there were also still refugees of the Firbolg around the area. They supported the war since they were enemies of the Tuatha Dé Danann. Balor was the leader of the Fomorians. He was giant and incredibly strong. Also, the Irish traditions claim that he had only one eye. However, that did not affect his strength. In that battle, Balor succeeded in killing Nuada, the king of the Tuatha Dé Danann. However, he died as well. Luj Lafhada was the champion of the Tuatha Dé Danann. He managed to avenge Nuada's death by killing Balor. 
remarkable this account of the Fomorians, and when we look into them, they seem to be yet another account of what's likely a corrupted group of human beings. And there are many unique details about giants, twisted creatures, and other aspects of the Fomorians who fought the Tuatha de Was this potentially in the Second Era? Was this more of a historical account or an objective account? There seem to be indications that it was. The Battle of Ventry. We alluded to the Battle of Ventry in the exploration of Skellig Michael, the great battle between Fionn Makul, the leader of the Fianna, and Dare Dawn, the king of the world. This seemed to be some sort of major event that occurred towards the end of the Second Era. And it's a remarkable account because we don't have a lot of information about who Dare Dawn, the king of the world, was. Yet there are allusions and other myths that indicate that someone existed as a king of the world. Now here I've used an old artistic picture of Alexander to represent Daredone, because I believe that there's a lot of consistency in accounts, and in my humble estimation, the true objective uh, historical account of Daredone may as well be Alexander the Great, because we just arbitrarily proclaim that some things have more so-called historiosity in them than others. We're going to be exploring the Battle of Entry in great detail, and it's an upcoming exploration to consider what it may have represented in the Second Era and what was truly at stake, especially when we consider the fact that there were accounts that Daredone had conquered every land except for Ireland at the time. What became of the Tuatha de Danann? The Sway of the Milesians. The Milesians was another race that existed in ancient Ireland. Legends refer to them as the Sons of Mill. In ancient times, when the Tuatha won the battle and took over, they had a deal with the Milesians. They kicked them out, but they said if they managed to land again in Ireland, the country shall be theirs. This was according to the rules of war. The Milesians withdrew and went back to the sea. Then the Tuatha raised a great storm to dash their ships and ensure their loss so they wouldn't come back. After that, they kept Ireland invisible. We have a very specific year here. In 1700 BC, the Milesians arrived in Ireland to realize that the Tuatha de Danann were entirely taking over. The Tuatha de Danann thought that they had managed to keep Ireland undetectable to the Milesians. However, they managed to find the land and marched into Ireland. The Tuatha were not prepared for resisting the Milesians as they didn't expect them to find the land that easily. And that's the end, really, of the Tuatha de Danann. Legend indicates that they went underground and they vanish from accounts. We don't have any more detail than that. We're also told that the Milesians are the progenitors of the people who inhabited Ireland in the contemporary era. Who knows if any of these details are true, but when we consider the overall account of the Tuatha de Danann, we see that this was a people that seemed to possess magic or a remarkable technology and had a very rich history. They also played a very decisive role in the Battle of Entry, as Fionn Makul and the Fianna were greatly outnumbered by the army of Daredone, the king of the world. Had the Tuatha de Danann not intervened and participated in the battle, it's very clear that the king of the world and his army would have defeated Fionn Makul and ultimately would have conquered all of Ireland and the entire world. What consequences would that have had for the old world? And what consequences would it have had on humanity today. It's clear that much was decided during this time frame. We'll be exploring the Tuatha de Danann and these myths more, and I will be looking at many other myths going forward. Well, thank you for joining me today. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe.